seen you at my and you was in as the day you'd met them. But it must have been if he'd daft or if he'd deprived or something. There was something not right about it. <laughs> we might be missed out. I don't know. We didn't know. My sex education was... <laughs> Just don't. <laughs> none. Zilch. <laughs> Absolutely none. I mean, people just simply didn't speak about it. We really didn't know. Well, what does it mean? Nothing out of the ordinary, but being. But for your wife, it's pretty revolutionary. She's going to produce in nine months a seven and a half pound baby from something no bigger than a pinpoint. My granny's sister she used to wag her finger at. She was like Grandma Giles in the cartoons. She used to wag her finger and say, "Just remember, a man can always put up his umbrella and walk away." Which I always used to mystify me, I couldn't think what I had to do with anything. Sex education in school was virtually nil, and certainly human sex just was not discussed at all. There was certainly no mention of genitals. When I took, you know, when I became a woman, when I started having my period. I was terrified, thought I was dying. My mother, uh, advice to me was, Keep yourself clean, stay away from boys, and that was total subject closed. And my mother said, listen, don't you go near boys and you'll have a baby. And see the next day, I mean, I was a tomboy, and you were going into the school sitting doing that. <laughs> they didn't tell you how. She just said that uh, I shouldn't let anybody touch me. It was so stupid. I'm going to have a baby. You can't believe it, can you? I can't believe it. I didn't think it could ever happen to me. If you were an unmarried mother, the psychiatrist would come and visit you. Single mothers were viewed as scum. Usually the girls had run away from home because it was a disgrace. You reap what you sow was the attitude. It was her fault all the time. She did it. She's dirty. She's bad. Lansdowne House was the name of the mother and baby home in Glasgow. It was an old Victorian house. The regime was quite harsh. You weren't really allowed out into the outside world unless accompanied by um, an adult. I was sorry for them. I mean, but for the grace of God, there go I. Do you say that? They could say that. I mean, if you, if you were a, a girl and you were normal and everything, you were hell of a tempted at times. And if I were on the verge of misdoing, let's call it what you like, my mother's voice, Margie, I'm watching you <laughs> in your head. As far as keeping my baby was concerned, that is something I would have loved to do. But I neither had the confidence, I didn't have the courage, I didn't have the backing. I remember being very protective of that last few hours and screaming at nurses who came in and disturbed me because I wanted just so much to have her. I remember dressing her. I remember touching her all over and kissing her and cuddling her. And I remember trying to smile as I handed her over and just saying look after my wee soul It's still early morning when the nurses the midwives and home helps of the public health service are getting ready for another day We went all over Glasgow from the Rotten Row and you did your deliveries and you looked after the mothers and babies There'd be a family in each room, and they would have a communal cooker on the landing that they all used. Some of the houses were very dirty, and they're bed bags. So uh, when you went back, you had to have a bath, get rid of all your bed bags and fleas and anything else you might have picked up en route. And I remember going once to deliver a baby in one of those houses, and the mother was 32, and the father was only 18. And they, they, they hadn't got very much. They only had one nappy, and they left it on the baby for 24 hours. And they had to practically peel it off by that time. When the baby was born, the father of the child, or the, the man in the family, usually went out. 
<laughs> oh no, no, that was nae. That was our only future pet. The general medical view is that this natural function is best carried out in the familiar surroundings of the home. After all, babies were born before hospitals existed. I had Caroline and Andrew at home. Having them at home was lovely because it was home atmosphere. Seeing you having your first baby, you didn't know it. They cut you up. I really did. I mean, it's so stupid. I think it done me any harm. I was that green, I didn't know where she was coming from. I used to think they cut you when you were a wee lassie. Somebody said they cut your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> My mother put a towel in the bed. And I pulled, supposed to pull the towel, and the nurse sat and she said, just push me. Push me with your feet. You can imagine it. I got on to this thing and push the hair with my feet. I was lying there <laughs> and heaving away. And she came over to the bed and sort of did an examination of everything and said, would you like a cigarette? And gave me a cigarette to smoke. <laughs> well, I was about an hour away from childbirth and I'd never smoked in my life before. <laughs> And the doctor said to me, do you mind, I've brought this student doctor with me. And he sat in a chair over at the corner of mother's house. And while the doctor was attended to me, I said, look at him, and he'd fainted and he fell onto the floor. <laughs> and the doctor had to carry him out, and my mother, <laughs> my mother didn't know what was going on. She thought it was something wrong with me. <laughs> Thinking about it must have been a pantomime. But I had my lovely baby. And will I have the baby in the hospital or at home, sister? Which do you prefer? Well, it's kind of awkward at home. I think I'd rather go to hospital. Well, if we can book a bed for you in hospital, we will. But you understand you're terribly full of all that. My oldest daughter I had in Lennox Castle Hospital. They usually got a dose of castor oil. She gave me a glass with castor oil and orange juice. An oil bath and an enema, or an OBE as they called it then. It wasn't a medal, it was oil bath and enema to help their labour on. Jolly fun. When a matron came round, I mean, she was very strict. Now, this one will strengthen those tired and softened stomach muscles. The matron certainly ruled with a rod of iron. You had to sit straight up in your bed and not have a crease in your bed. And it was, you know, we were really frightened of her. Your nose had to be in line with the fold in the bed spread, you know, and it was sitting up whether you felt like sitting up or not, you know. It was a holy terror, I think. <laughs> used to force you to breastfeed. And then if he, you got sore breasts around, they had to bind them up. And then you would express your milk for premature babies and things like that, you know. And it was hard going, you know, in the days. Could be nicer, could be sweeter, could be better, could be smarter, could be cuter, baby, than your eyes, your pores. That cute, fantastic nose, you're mighty like a knockout. Oh yes, the babies had quite an outfit. The baby had a nappy and uh, then it had a rubber thing over the nappy. And then it had a vest and a barricot. Do you know what a barricot is? Well, it was like a gown, a big long gown, but no sleeves in it. But before you'd done that, you'd a binder. And it was flannel, and you got the binder, and you're out, you rolled it around the stomach. And then there was tapes that went round and round the baby's legs, to, and the poor baby's like a mummy. What a nightmare. My mother said, you don't use pins. Now, that was ridiculous, because there were special on-guard pins that they were safe. But she said, no, I had to sew it on. Now, that was more dangerous. I might have put the pin through them. Yeah, I might have put the needle through. This child is being received into the church. Blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon thee and abide with thee, now and always. Amen. You could take them any morning in christened, but she must have been christened the first Sunday after she was born. You would make up a christened piece, and it would be made up with two Abernethy biscuits, and you would put butter on them and put money inside them. And you'd put a bit of silver in it for luck, which we did. 
the first person you met in the street, whoever you met, you gave the christening piece to. I went uh, a full nine month plus about a fortnight and they decided they would take me into hospital. I got a phone call. I was told that the baby was dead inside my, inside Rita. And, but I hadn't to tell her. Because she had to have the strength to endure what she had to go through. And my father-in-law was on one side. He held her on one hand and I held her on the other hand. And, you know, and we tried to um, take her through that everything was going to be all right, although both of us knew that the baby was dead. And uh, I had to work right through the, the night to try and um, so that they could see the, the, the baby's head. And then I don't remember anything after that. I was put out. It was chloroform they used. I nearly lost my wife. In the morning, they said, well, you know that there isn't any baby. The baby uh, was a full-term nine-pound baby girl, uh, stillborn. But at the time it was devastating, really devastating. My mother always, she used to wash all the dead. The undertaker didn't do it in the days. He didn't get any funeral parlours in the days. Everybody was brought home. And I reminded my mother, washing him and putting a new white shirt on him. It was interesting to see that the, the people who knew how this was done, once they had finished, they would take the container of water, like the basin the water was in, and they would dig a hole in the ground and pour the water into that hole, instead of just throwing it away, because they reckoned that human cells were in that water, and so it, the water itself was treated with great respect. The coffin lid was never put on until the last minute. A saucer of salt would be laying on the chest of the dead person and a cross made with two iron nails laid in the salt. And there was another tradition too that uh, people would put their hand on the forehead of the dead person and uh, if you did that then you would forget what the person looked like when they were dead and just remember them as they had been in life. So I was taken in the next door and I was told to touch her uh, on the brow, which I did, and uh, I had quite a, uh, an ordeal trying to get over that. I didn't like that custom. The blinds were drawn all the time the body was in the house. And the curtains were closed over and mirrors turned to the wall. You pop the, up the window and let the soul go out. And the day of the funeral, all the neighbours closed their curtains. All the shops would shut, you know, in the street. And then um, the men went off to the burial. And in those days, women didn't go to funerals. Very, very seldom did you get a woman at a funeral. They stayed at home, made a cup of tea in a bun and maybe opened a bottle of whiskey for the men coming back. And anybody meeting a cortege would stop until it passed. The fellas stand in the corner with their, their bonnets off in respect. In these days, there were a lot of respect for, for these things, and folk did respect them. We arranged the funeral and we got a taxi and I had a wee white coffin on my knees and with my father-in-law and the minister we drove up to the cemetery in Millport and that little baby is interred beside some of Rita's relatives 
Um, I think the hut is still there. But the blessing of two other children helps to take away that hurt. And we're grateful, we're grateful. of Scotland on film in two weeks' time.